For a hundred years, American railroads swore nothing could dethrone the steam locomotive. Then a new engine arrived, dismissed as too weak for freight. Yet inside just three decades, those same engines swept steam off the rails, shutting down centuries of tradition and billions in infrastructure. How did the machine that rail barons mocked end up rewriting railroad history? And why was almost everyone so blind to what was coming next? Steam locomotives once shaped the very rhythm of American life. For more than a century, their thunder echoed across the continent, hauling grain from the Midwest, steel from Pittsburgh, and passengers from bustling city stations to small town depots. Every main line and branch depended on these iron giants, some weighing over 400 tons and stretching nearly 100 feet from cowcatcher to tender. Their silhouettes dominated rail yards, their whistles marked the passage of time, and their crews, the engineers, firemen, and brakemen, formed a brotherhood built on heat, grit, and coal dust. The scale of steam's reign was staggering. By the 1930s, tens of thousands of steam engines rolled over more than 250,000 miles of track. Keeping them running took an army. Machinists, boilermakers, waterboys, coal handlers, and roundhouse crews. Every 100 miles or so, trains stopped for water, coal, and inspection. Towers and tanks dotted the landscape. Each one was a lifeline for locomotives that could burn through 10,000 gallons of water and 20 tons of coal in a single day. Roundhouses, massive circular buildings, housed engines for nightly maintenance and repairs, and for the daily ritual of turning these behemoths for their next run. Entire towns grew up around the needs of steam. Shops and depots provided steady work for generations, and the sound of a locomotive whistle meant commerce, connection, and opportunity. Steam power was more than a machine, it was a symbol of progress, a source of pride, and for many, a way of life handed down from father to son. To imagine anything replacing this vast, deeply rooted system seemed unthinkable. Yet beneath the smoke and steam, change was already on the horizon. In the 1920s, the men running America's railroads dismissed a new kind of locomotive almost out of hand. It ran on diesel fuel instead of coal and they saw it as a curiosity. Maybe fine for switching cars around a yard or pulling a short passenger train, but certainly not for the heavy freight that kept the nation's economy moving. Boardrooms from New York to Chicago echoed with the same refrain. Diesel electric locomotives were too weak, too unproven, and too expensive to replace the tried and true steam giants that had hauled the country through two world wars and decades of growth. Steam was muscle, tradition, and certainty. Diesel was an outsider, met with raised eyebrows and polite laughter. Yet within a single generation, the impossible became reality. By 1960, the same industry that had once scoffed at diesel power had almost completely abandoned steam. The transformation did not drag out over centuries or even half a lifetime. In just about 30 years, every major railroad in the United States had retired its steam fleet, shuttered its coal towers, and handed over the rails to a machine it once called too weak for freight. This was not a slow, gentle evolution. The timeline reads more like a flip of a switch. In the early 1930s, steam reigned unchallenged. By the end of the 1950s, steam was a memory. Scrapped, sold, or parked in city parks as relics. Railroad executives who had once bet their careers on the power of steam found themselves signing contracts for fleets of diesel-electric locomotives, sometimes within the span of a single decade. The reversal left entire towns, places built around the needs of steam, scrambling to adapt as the, life, the lifeblood of their local economies vanished almost overnight. How did a machine once written off as a novelty sweep aside a century of tradition in less than 30 years? The answer lies not in brute force, but in a set of advantages that few in the industry saw coming. The story of that reversal 
is as much about human stubbornness as it is about engineering. A diesel-electric locomotive operates on a principle that, at first glance, seems almost roundabout. Instead of using its engine to turn the wheels directly, it employs a diesel engine known as the prime mover to spin a generator. This generator produces electricity, which is then fed to traction motors mounted on each axle. As the engineer pushes the throttle, the diesel engine revs up, the generator outputs more current, and the motors respond instantly, delivering torque straight to the rails. There is no need for the massive drive rods or complex valve gear that defined steam power. The entire drivetrain is enclosed, bathed in oil, and designed for long, uninterrupted stretches of work. Engineers at Electromotive Division, EMD, spent years refining this system. Their breakthrough came with the development of multiple unit control, MU control. This allowed a single crew in one cab to operate several locomotives at once all linked by a cable running from unit to unit. With MU control, a line of diesel electrics could be coupled together, two, three, or even four at a time, and respond as if they were one machine. The engineer's hand on the throttle controlled every generator and every traction motor down the line. This was a radical departure from steam, where each locomotive required its own crew and constant attention. The diesel electrics design meant fewer moving parts exposed to the elements, less wear and tear, and a level of consistency steam engines simply could not match. The generator and traction motors delivered steady, continuous power at all speeds, without the peaks and valleys of steam's performance curve. Maintenance became a matter of scheduled checks, not daily heroics. The entire approach was modular, scalable and thanks to MU control, flexible enough to handle any train the railroad could throw at it. This technical foundation, invisible to the eye but essential to the story, would soon upend everything the railroads thought they knew about power and reliability. On the railroad, time is money. For decades, line haul schedulers built their timetables around the relentless needs of steam, water stops, coal refills, and lengthy maintenance windows. About every 100 miles or so, a train had to pause for water, then again for coal, then again for inspection. Crews planned their shifts around these breaks. Entire maintenance teams waited at roundhouses, ready for the next arrival. The rhythm was predictable, but it was also fragile. A single delay at a water tower could cascade down the line, throwing schedules into chaos. With diesel electrics, that old rhythm vanished. Suddenly, a locomotive could run 500 miles or more without stopping for fuel. There was no need to refill massive tenders with coal, no more searching for the next water plug, no more idling for hours while a boiler cooled down. On a diesel, a crew could climb aboard in Chicago and run straight through to St. Louis, only pausing for a quick check or a crew change. The engine itself did not care about the weather, the grade, or the length of the train. It just kept turning fuel into motion, mile after mile. Servicing routines transformed overnight. Where a steam locomotive required daily attention, oiling rods, cleaning grates, scraping out ash, a diesel needed little more than a scheduled inspection every few days. The most common task became checking oil levels and filters, not shoveling coal, or wrestling with jammed injectors. Maintenance crews shrank, and their jobs shifted from heavy, dirty labor to monitoring gauges and swapping out standardized parts. Reliability soared. Instead of spending one-third of its life in the shop, a diesel electric could spend up to 90% of its time on the rails, earning revenue. For dispatchers and operations staff, this new freedom from constant servicing changed everything. Trains could be scheduled for longer, uninterrupted runs. Freight moved faster, with fewer delays and less uncertainty. The old bottlenecks, water towers, coal docks, roundhouses, began to disappear from the landscape, replaced by a handful of fueling points spaced hundreds of miles apart. The backbone of railroad operations shifted from brute force to relentless, dependable motion. 
In late 1939, a four-unit diesel-electric locomotive set out from EMD's LaGrange plant on a journey that would challenge every assumption in American railroading. Designated FT-103, this demonstrator wasn't just a prototype, it was a rolling laboratory staffed by EMD engineers who logged every mile, every grade, and every ton of freight hauled. Over the next year, FT-103 crossed 35 states and racked up more than 83,000 miles, visiting 20 of the nation's largest railroads. It climbed Tennessee Pass in the Rockies, tackled the steep grades of Tehachapi in California, and pulled 16,000-ton ore trains across the Mesabi Range. On the Santa Fe, the FT ran 12,871 miles in just 32 days, slicing scheduled freight times in half and running from Bakersfield to Barstow without a single water stop. Railroad crews and managers put the locomotive through every trial they could devise. They coupled it to 17 car passenger trains, loaded it with heavy freight, and sent it up the toughest hills they could find. The FT didn't flinch. Its multiple unit control allowed a single engineer to handle all four units as one, something steam simply couldn't match. Maintenance teams, accustomed to daily repairs on steam, found themselves with little to do. The FT's logs recorded zero major failures and no downtime chargeable to the machine on any railroad. The results spoke louder than any sales pitch. After the tour, order books filled overnight. The Santa Fe bought 155A units and 165B units, while Southern Railway took the demonstrator itself and put it to work as number 6100. By the time the FT's cross-country journey ended, EMD's test crew had left a trail of converted skeptics and a clear record. The diesel-electric could do the job, day after day, with reliability, steam couldn't touch. Railroad accountants began to run the numbers. What they found turned skepticism into urgency. A single diesel-electric locomotive could deliver the same freight ton miles as three steam engines. This was not just theory. It played out in daily operations. Steam locomotives spent much of their lives idle, waiting for water, coal, or repairs. Diesels stayed on the rails, working up to 20 hours a day, week after week. For every mile a steam engine hauled freight, a diesel covered three, with far fewer interruptions. The crew requirements told a similar story. A heavy steam freight train often needed two or three engines, each with its own engineer and fireman. With diesel electrics, one crew could control multiple units from a single cab, thanks to multiple unit control. Fewer people, fewer paychecks, and simplified scheduling. These savings rippled across the entire system. Fuel costs dropped as well. Steam burned through coal and water at a staggering rate, while diesel sipped fuel, using less than half the energy per ton mile. Maintenance budgets shrank. Steam's endless moving parts and daily repairs gave way to scheduled inspections and quick part swaps. The numbers were clear. Diesels cut operating costs by more than half in many cases and kept trains moving when steam would be sidelined for hours or days. Then came World War II. The War Production Board demanded maximum efficiency. Railroads faced a surge in freight, raw materials, tanks, food, and troops moving across the continent around the clock. Steam's downtime became a liability. Diesels, with their ability to run nearly nonstop, became essential. Wartime planners watching the tonnage curves climb higher each month pushed for more diesel orders even as material shortages forced tough choices. The war proved what the numbers already suggested. To keep up with national demand, railroads needed power that was always ready, always available. The diesel's economic logic became a matter of national necessity. Steam locomotives demanded a support network as sprawling as the rails the sprawling as the rails themselves. Every hundred miles, the line was anchored by a coaling tower, sometimes rising six stories above the tracks, built to pour tons of coal into tenders in minutes. 
water towers stood nearby, their tanks filled by pumps running day and night. Without these, a locomotive could go no farther than a single county. Roundhouses, with their fan of tracks and central turntable, became the heart of each division. Here, engines lined up for inspection, repair, or a full overhaul, sometimes after only a day's work. Each facility needed a small army, laborers to unload coal, maintain pumps, and keep the machinery running, machinists to swap out worn bearings or patch a leaking boiler, and watchmen to stoke fires and keep the water from freezing in winter. This web of infrastructure stretched across the continent, tying up land, money, and manpower. For every mile of track, there were hidden costs, brick by brick, tank by tank, pay stub by pay stub. Railroad accountants faced a stark reality when diesel electrics began replacing steam. The numbers were impossible to ignore. According to Association of American Railroads reports, by 1960, nearly 90% of all maintenance facilities built for steam had been closed or demolished. Those included roundhouses, coaling towers, and water stations. The Interstate Commerce Commission inventories from the late 1930s listed more than 2,400 roundhouses and over 18,000 coaling plants across the country. Two decades later, fewer than 300 roundhouses remained and coaling towers had all but vanished. Water stations, once spaced every 20 to 100 miles, dropped from over 40,000 to just a handful, mostly on tourist lines or branch routes. For railroad chief financial officers and operations planners, this was more than a technical upgrade. It was a financial windfall. Land, labor, and upkeep costs plummeted as the need for steam-specific infrastructure evaporated. Annual reports from major lines like the Pennsylvania Railroad in Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe showed infrastructure spending slashed by hundreds of millions of dollars. The dieselization of the fleet transformed railroading from a patchwork of local servicing points into a streamlined, regionally managed system. What once demanded an army of workers and a web of facilities now required only a fraction of the resources, turning the balance sheet in favor of the new machine. By 1960, the era of steam had reached its quiet conclusion. Across the country, the last of the great locomotives lined up in scrapyards, hulking shapes stripped of brass and steel, waiting for the torch. In places like Roanoke and Altoona, men who had spent their lives tending boilers and turning wrenches watched as roundhouses closed. And the familiar whistle faded from the night air. Union halls that once bustled with machinists and firemen emptied out. Their skills suddenly obsolete. Some found work maintaining diesels. But many more left railroading behind. For the communities built around steam, the change came swiftly. Shops shuttered, neighborhoods lost their anchor, and a way of life slipped into memory. A handful of engines escaped the breaker's yard, preserved in city parks or museum halls, living reminders of an age when steam was king. Today, retired engineers and preservationists keep their stories alive, recalling the pride and camaraderie, the long nights on the road, and the day the Iron Giants rolled out for the last time. Today, railroads move more freight with fewer resources than ever, a direct legacy of choosing efficiency over tradition. As industries face mounting pressure to do more with less, the lesson is clear. Underestimated innovation can upend even the most entrenched powers. In a world still driven by speed and cost, strength is not always what it seems. Thanks for riding along. Share your thoughts below.